Hello, I'm David Rubenstein, and I'm going to be in conversation today with Maggie Haberman, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist with the New York Times. And we're going to talk about her book, Confidence Man, The Making of Donald Trump and the Breaking of America. And um, we're coming to you from the Robert H. Smith Auditorium at the New York Historical Society. Maggie, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you for having me. So uh, when I used to read your articles, and I enjoyed reading your articles in the New York Times, I always wondered uh, how you managed to get interviews with Donald Trump, because your articles weren't that favorable to him, I would say. <laughs> so how did he, why did he keep giving you interviews? Uh, he is uniquely obsessed with the New York Times, and I just happen to be the person who covered him more often for the paper. But the, the place the paper holds in his psyche as the outer borough guy from Queens who always wanted to be approved of by elites, uh, it's, it's hard to overstate. So when Donald Trump first began uh, saying he might run for president, did you roll your eyes and think there's no businessman in New York is going to get elected president of the United States? I definitely questioned, uh, A, whether he would actually run, and B, whether a businessman from New York could win, especially one with the social positions that he had taken. He had been uh, pro-choice for many, many years, uh, pro-abortion uh, rights. And so, you know, he also, when I started covering him in earnest, was 2011 from Politico, when he was considering running. And we treated it actually pretty seriously because he was rising in the polls and he was striking a chord, mostly on this lie about President Obama's birthplace. Um, but then he didn't run. And so in 2015, I was very skeptical. So when you covered Trump and you got to know him better, uh, how influential was his father in creating the personality that we now know as Donald Trump? Um, his father was a domineering real estate person. Uh, he seems to have intimidated Donald Trump as a youth. Um, what can you tell us about that? There's no question. There, there are two main influences in Donald Trump's life. Um, one is Roy Cohn and one is his father, Fred Trump. And Fred Trump really was a self-made man. I mean, Fred Trump was the, the son of German immigrants. He built up this you know, local real estate empire, but it was very successful. He was uh, involved in local politics. He worked the Brooklyn political machine. But he was, in the words of Ivana Trump, a brutal father. He was very, very tough on his children. He was very curt. He was very brusque. Uh, and he instilled in his son this you know, need to win at all costs and promoted his son as the heir and was very undermining in things that he would say and was very tough on his kids and was very driving. So Donald Trump was sent to a, a military mm -hmm. academy. Why did he go to a military academy? Did he want to be in the military? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I don't think so. There are various explanations offered for why he got sent to the military academy, but it was the overarching consensus is there were behavioral reasons that his father sent him away for. He was a good athlete there, I guess, right? Very good athlete. I mean, and, and, and he really was. I don't, I don't think he was, you know, he didn't perform the way he claims he performed, you know, the best on the baseball team and so forth. Um, he was known among the other students as somebody whose father was bailing him out with the school a lot. So he went to Fordham initially for two years. Mm -hmm. And why did he transfer out of Fordham? He went to the University of Pennsylvania subsequently, right? He went to Wharton, yeah. I mean, his sister, Marianne, has, has told people in the past of Fordham, that's where he got in. And I think that was the, the honest answer as to why he went there. And I think he did not consider to Fordham to be up to you know, the, the credentialist nature that he and has. And how did he do at Wharton? Well, uh, we don't know. It has been impossible to try to get his transcripts um, from his various schoolings. It has been you know, very difficult to get people to speak with candor about how he actually did. There have been all kinds of stories about him having people take the SATs for him or help study for him. Look, academics is not his thing. So, I, you know, if I, if I had to guess how he did, uh, I, I doubt it was a, an A student. So there are some people who work with him who suggest that he might have a uh, dyslexia, and dyslexia makes it difficult to read, and it's difficult to be a great student. Do you have any reason to think that he is dyslexic in some respects or had dyslexia? With the, with the caveat that I'm not a diagnostician and I'm not a doctor and no one has ever said what he, what, what, whether he is, People who have been around him over many decades, not just in the White House and not just in his campaigns, have commented that other than news stories, he really doesn't read. Um, he doesn't read books. Uh, he certainly didn't read briefing books in the White House. Um, they have theorized that he has some trouble with it. One thing that I was surprised to learn when I was reporting the book from people who worked with him in, in the 90s was that he would, in the mornings, at like 6 a.m., call colleagues and want to know what was in the newspapers. And it was as, as if he wanted to get briefed before he was getting his hands on them. 
Okay, so after he graduates from uh, Wharton, he goes to work for his father. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately he decides to go to the big part of the big city, which was Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And his first project is a redevelopment of a hotel. And mm -hmm. that made him famous at a relatively young age. I think he was in his late twenties. It did. Um, I want to add one caveat in there. He had toyed with going to film school um, and then ended up not doing that and going to work for his father. Um, he has told people privately that his father didn't want him doing that. So his first project was this Commodore Hotel, this decrepit hotel on the east side, 42nd Street, uh, remake into the Grand Hyatt. It's not a massive real estate project, but it was coming at a moment when New York City was, was on its heels fiscally, and it helped him seem as if he was sort of this larger than life figure, and he got a ton of press around it. And subsequently, he tried to build other buildings, but did he build a lot of buildings in New York other than the Trump Tower? That's his major building, mm -hmm. is that right? That's his major building. And there are a couple of smaller projects around. There's a, a UN area building. There's uh, another one on the east side. You know, he spent years focused on a west side project that just never came to fruition in the way he had hoped, where he'd envisioned a television city. Um, but no, he, he's, he's a very small level builder. So um, a lot of financial problems arose when we went through some recessions in the late 80s and so forth. Did Donald Trump come close to filing for bankruptcy and how did he avoid it? So Donald Trump uh, in the 1990s uh, filed for, for bankruptcy related to his casinos. He didn't file for personal bankruptcy. It was something he was seeking to avoid at all costs, primarily because the banks bailed him out because they decided, particularly because he was such an employer in Atlantic City, that it was more in their interests to keep him going than to have him go under. Okay, so he gets involved in more public affairs and so forth, and let's go to the campaign. Mm -hmm. So. To run for president, you have to be organized, you have to raise money typically, and he said he would be a self-funder. Did he really have that much cash to be able to fund and how did he do it? Well, I don't know that he had how much cash he actually had. He put in very little cash, but he, he claimed that he was going to be uh, supporting this endeavor. Instead, it was something that everybody else supported through donations. Um, I believe he got reimbursed uh, on the loan because that's just generally how campaigns work. But that having been said, he was so ingrained in pop culture, he was so known to Republican voters that he was able to do things another candidate just simply wouldn't have been able to. You say he was known to Republican voters. Uh, yes, uh, he became a Republican at some point, but had he not been a Democrat? And a Republican too. I mean, he, he sw and an independent. He switched his registration over and over and over, which is, is sort of fitting. Um, he gave primarily to Democrats in New York because there are primarily Democrats in New York. But his personal politics were always much more an Exonian law and order, sort of 1968 variety. Okay, so in the famous uh, ride down the escalator at Trump Tower, um, did he intend to get as much tension as he did by talking about people coming from Mexico and they're not the best people and so forth. That just happened by happenstance. I think it was pretty organic. I mean, you know, he had a prepared speech that he threw aside when he got down there. And then, you know, he was just off to the races and he saw that he was getting a reaction. But I will say his advisors had been talking to him about immigration. Immigration, when he was looking at running in 2011, was not something he was really talking about. This was instilled in him by Roger Stone and an aide named Sam Nunberg because that's where the Republican electorate was. Okay, so he starts running and then he has debates. I think there's 16 other Republican candidates yes. ultimately. So did he really think that he could stand on the stage with all these more uh, experienced political figures and debate these issues? Or did he, uh, did he bone up on these issues or he just didn't think he needed to, to do that? I, I, he looked at it as some other you know, media event that he was going through. And he had bluffed his way through so many before that he didn't see a reason to be different. And as it turned out, he really wasn't wrong because the debates are a big part of why he won that primary. So the campaign um, is floundering a bit mm -hmm. and uh, is maybe running out of money. And at some point he decides to have a reset and he brings in Steve Bannon and um, others uh, who convinced him that he needed a, a reset, and how did that come about? So he was he was souring on Paul Manafort for a number of reasons. Paul Manafort was the campaign chairman at that point. It, it, the, Paul Manafort basically helped oust Corey Lewandowski, who had been the campaign manager until then. I mean, it was a, it, a crazy three-month period. But it was a couple of donors. It was Trump's own children. Uh, it was the fact that Manafort was getting a lot of bad headlines. Trump did not need a ton of convincing, but Bannon is also a very effective salesman, and he was in Trump's at that point too. So you talked about his family members. Um, were his siblings involved in the campaign or is he close to them? 
Uh, well, he had been very close to his sister, uh, Marianne. She was the, uh, the, the one he was the closest to. They had a, a falling out because she was on video, on audio tape by their niece, Mary Trump, being very critical of him. His sister, Elizabeth, he's not particularly close with. His brother, Freddie, had passed away. Robert Trump, who he had had a huge falling out with based on business stuff decades earlier, they actually had had a rapprochement, but he was not, as, as far as I know, meaningfully involved in the campaign. What about his children? His children were. I think they were initially aware of the campaign because everything the Trumps do is as a unit, basically. And his, his family was like that, too, with Fred and Mary Trump, um, his mother. Um, but they are, uh, they are just constantly you know, one front together. And then as time wore on, especially after Iowa, the kids got much more involved. He was heavily reliant on Ivanka Trump in particular. Ivanka Trump was the child who was the most involved, would you say, um, in the campaign? Her husband was the person who was the most involved, Jared Kushner, who became more and more active in it, who Trump really listened to. He has a very soft voice. It seemed to be very calming to Trump. And as a non-family member, he could say things to Trump that the others couldn't. Okay, so he's going to be the nominee of the party. Um, who does he want to pick as vice president? And how did he come to pick Mike Pence? Well, I don't think he wanted to pick anyone as vice president because I don't think he ever really, I don't think he, I don't think he understood that, you know, the, the concept or why he needed one. He joked about Ivanka at one point could be it. He looked at Newt, he looked at Chris Christie, he looked at Mike Pence. Mike Pence was the choice of Paul Manafort and some of his children because he could help with evangelical voters and he was never gonna upstage Trump. If, if it had been Newt Gingrich and Donald Trump, they would have fought the whole time. Now, he had previously had a relationship with Hillary Clinton in the sense that uh, I think she went to his wedding or one of his weddings. She did. She went to his third wedding. Yeah. Okay. And so they were social. They knew each other socially. They knew each other. I wouldn't say that they were they friends, friends, but, but they, they knew, were, each, they knew other. each other socially. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, he had played golf with mm -hmm. Bill Clinton from mm -hmm. time to time. So um, why was he so determined to beat Hillary Clinton? Did he, In the end, did he come to just see her as an enemy? or just the, the, uh, the, the person who would block him from becoming president? No, I mean, he was, uh, he was very angry at the criticism by the campaign of him. And he internalizes all criticism and uses it as a justification for whatever attack he's going to do. That was it. Okay, so he wins the election. Is he shocked that he wins that night? And, yes. and he, he will say he wasn't, but yes, he was. So the next day, um, does he say, like, you know, the stars have fallen and I now have the burden of the world on my shoulders. Is he worried about it or not? No, really? he says, how cool is this? You know, yeah. I mean, look at, look at, look at this thing that, it, look at this thing that just happened. Look at what I want. All these people are calling me. You know, the leader of this country is calling me. The leader of that one, the Japanese prime minister calls, here, talk to Ivanka. You know, it was, it was not, that literally happened. It was not, um, it, it, he wasn't looking at it the way somebody else would. So what was the cabinet selection process like? Was there a, a pre-election transition effort that had a lot of potential names, or how did they, these names come about? So some of the names had been in rotation previously, but then they ended up in different jobs. Jeff Sessions would be a good example. A lot of names were being offered to Trump by various people he knew in New York or he knew in Republican Party circles. Mitch McConnell was, you know, making suggestions. Uh, it was not a formal typical process, and Jared was running his own process at the same time. There's a, there was, seemed to be, in the beginning of the administration, a lot of leaking, more than normal. White House staffs always leak. Was that a great time for reporters because it's, you got all these leaks coming? We definitely favor more information than less. It was a chaotic time. Jared and Bannon actually went to the White House as allies. They ended up having a split as time went on in the first few months. Um, there were definitely people who were leaking against each other for factional, factionalized reasons. There were a lot of people who were brought into that administration as sort of, you know, what one advisor to a, a mayor I knew used to refer to as government auto mechanics. These were government auto mechanics around Republican circles, and they knew how things functioned, and they were brought in, but they didn't like Trump, and they were very disturbed by what they were seeing. And so a lot of times they were talking to reporters to try to just process what they were learning about. So President Trump had four chiefs of staff. Mm -hmm. uh, the first was Reince Priebus, mm -hmm. who had been the head of the RNC. Mm -hmm. uh, why did Trump pick him as chief of staff initially? Uh, because uh, Paul Ryan suggested that he would be a good person because he knew Washington and because some of the other names that were being suggested seemed unwise. Okay, and how did that relationship work? Not well. I mean, Reince Priebus was gone by August of 2017 because Trump, the idea of Trump and a chief of staff is hard to process. You have to be willing to defer to your chief of staff, let them handle certain things. Trump just undid everything Priebus did all the time. And Jared Kushner did too. 
So uh, of the four chiefs of staff, which one was the most effective or do, which one was he the closest to? Uh, he was personally the closest to Mark Meadows, who was not the most effective chief of staff. Mark Meadows presided over the worst period of time in that administration um, and, and has a direct hand in problems with the COVID response and with the post-election behavior. John Kelly was the most effective. So go through a typical day. When, when did Trump get up in the morning? Is he an early riser, a late riser? He's a bad sleeper. So he is often up. You know, you would sometimes see 3 a.m. tweets, you know, but he would be up by 6 a.m. usually watching morning television. Um, he would claim that he didn't watch Morning Joe or CNN. He would watch both. Um, he would start calling people that early. You know, Paul Ryan had to train him. Can you just wait until I, I'm done with my morning workout until we start talking? Um, they tried having him come down around 9 a.m., but it started sliding back later and later. But did he actually do the tweets himself or did he have a person that did it for him? There were times that tweets were done by committee, that they were drafted, that aides, you know, aides were often proposing them. Um, but at that time of the morning, it was generally him, or at night, it was him himself. Okay. So what were his relations like with members of Congress? Did he treat them with respect, or how did he deal along with them? That's a really good question. You know, he was very effective with Republican House members. He was not with Democratic House members because he, you know, everything became split by party with him, and he didn't understand the need to woo the other side of the aisle. But with Republicans, he was very good at using the White House, Air Force One, Marine One, as ways to, these were toys, to keep them on his side. And he was very good at working the phones. And this is something that he did throughout his, his time at you know, the Trump Organization in New York, too. He was good at it. So in foreign policy, he, he uh, dealt with all the heads of state you're mm -hmm. supposed to deal with. His trips overseas, were they generally things that are well scheduled, organized? Did he enjoy going overseas to meet heads of state? He did, and, and they were well organized, but they often did not go off well because he would go off script or because he would you know, get angry at world leaders or he'd tweet something as he was flying into the UK and insult the prime minister. And So what about uh, Russia? He seemed to have a, a, almost a man crush on uh, Putin. <laughs> what, what was the reason for that, would you say? So I don't think we've ever established exactly why he was so praising and fa often fawning about Vladimir Putin. I can come up with a couple of reasons. He generally likes strong men. Um, he uh, has autocratic instincts. He, uh, I think, just generally speaking, admires the behavior of Putin uh, and admires the fact that Putin is not constrained by something like a constitution. So on, under our laws, the president of the United States has no financial constraints. He can right. have a blind trust, as mm -hmm. President Kennedy did, or not have a blind trust. Right. Uh, how did he keep his business operations separate from uh, what he was doing in the government. Did, did his two sons really run the business then? So his two sons, but particularly Eric Trump, were the were the were at least the figureheads of the business. Um, I think we're still learning about exactly what Trump was doing in terms of his business in office, and I think we're going to be learning about that from some for some time. At minimum, he tried doing things like use his ambassador to the UK to get a golf tournament at one of his Scotland tournaments. Um, you know, he was not unaware of what was taking place. He would, you know, host events at Mar-a-Lago. Everybody within the Republican Party started hosting events at his clubs. It didn't, it, it, maybe some of it happened organically, and I think in some cases it did, but in other cases it didn't. So President Trump had a number of investigations. Uh, the first one was the Mueller investigation. Mm -hmm. In the end, um, it didn't produce anything that changed anybody's uh, habits or anything. Was right? Was he obsessed with the Mueller investigation? He was beyond obsessed. It 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 ate into his presidency. I would say for the first two years. Now, it didn't it didn't produce anything that I guess you know quote unquote changed minds, but. It did lead to a lot of indictments, the Mueller investigation of a lot of people around him, including Paul Manafort. Um, it was never going to lead to an indictment of a, of a president, whether, regardless of whether the evidence actually led there or not, because of a Justice Department advisory opinion dating back to the Nixon days that you don't indict a sitting president. So, but what it did do was it told a, a pretty um, complicated story and a Senate Intelligence Committee report that looked at the same issues did the same thing. So Trump likes to say this report exonerated me. It, it is, as it often is with him, a lot more complicated than that. So he was the only president we've had who's been impeached twice. The first impeachment dealt with a call that he made to, I guess, the president of to Ukraine. Saying, Ukraine. Was he worried that he would actually be impeached and convicted, or he knew he would never be convicted by the Senate? He believed that he would never be convicted by the Senate because of his relationship with Mitch McConnell at that point and the other senators. So. Um, what would you say he would say were his biggest accomplishments as president? Uh, well, 
what he would say are his biggest accomplishments would relate to expanding the military, which he overstates. Um, he would say that a big accomplishment, and th this one really was something that, that he did, was moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem uh, in Israel. Um, he would talk about uh, building a border wall, which they only built about 500 miles worth of. Um, you know, th those would be. Well, in the border the wall, he had a very popular line in the, in the campaign that he was running the first time. I'm going to build a wall, build wall, and I'm going to get the Mexicans to, to pay, pay for, for it. it. Yes. Well, did, where did the idea of the Mexicans paying for it come from? It was all Roger Stone and Sam Nunberg. That whole idea, the border wall in particular, was initially done to get him to remember to talk about immigration, and then it morphed into something different. Okay. So some of the accomplishments I think to Trump supporters would, would cite would be the Abraham Accords. So mm -hmm. How did that Definitely. come about? Um, that was largely uh, Jared Kushner run, in all seriousness. Um, and, it, and, it, and it was a real accomplishment. Um, you know, it, its effectiveness is debated. Uh, not everyone agrees uh, that, that it was as significant as they claim. But it was a big achievement. It did change the region. Um, Trump, again, was sort of along for the ride on that, as he was with many policy pieces. But that was really Jared Kushner's baby. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the re-election. Did he ever have any um, doubt in his mind he wanted to be re-elected? Or did he just say, look, I, four years is enough and I want to go do something else? I think he was definitely worn out by the job by 2020, but there, he wanted to win re-election. Did he take uh, Joe Biden seriously as an opponent? No, he did not, and, and he should have. And why did he, he just thought because he didn't know him or he just thought he, because of his age or something? I think his age, I think that he bought into the line of sort of, you know, Biden making gaffes and, and all of the things known about him before. And the debates, I've observed over the years uh, that incumbent presidents of the United States don't prepare for debates that much because they think I, they know the yes. issues that well. Yeah. Did Donald Trump really prepare very much for that debate, the first debate with, with uh, Joe Biden? He did not. Um, and, and that was something that uh, his folks had been very upset with him about. You are correct. There's a long tradition of that. There was something else with that first debate, which is that Donald Trump may have had COVID and was on stage very animated and red and sweating. He was much sicker than they ever said publicly, much. We found out later, my colleagues and I, six months later, that he had had um, what was known as COVID pneumonia, infiltrates in his lungs. The public health officials in the administration believed that if he had not been given monoclonal antibody treatment, that he would have died. I see. And um, did he ever get told that? I think they were pretty clear with him how serious his health was. He knew he, knew he was sick. So let's talk about the reelection. So when the election came forward that night, um, and Arizona is declared mm -hmm. by Fox for Biden, uh, did that really upset him? And did he ask Jared to do something about it? It was a seismic moment uh, when Fox News called Arizona for Biden. Trump said, get that fixed. Uh, Kushner called Murdoch. Um, there were, there was, it, was, it caused all kinds of chaos within Fox News, but Fox stuck to it. And then the AP did it a few hours later. Okay, so when he wakes up, um, people say Biden is gonna be the president. Does he immediately think that the election is stolen from him? Who convinces him the election is stolen? So for the first few days, the campaign's own data was showing that Trump could make up votes in Arizona and in a couple of other states. By Friday, it was clear that was not the case. Saturday is when the networks called the race for Biden. Um, Trump had already started suggesting the election was going to be stolen from him months earlier when there was widespread by mail voting because of COVID. So I don't think Trump needed convincing. I think this is something Trump's been saying for years. Was there any uh, plan by Donald Trump to actually not leave the Oval Office as has been suggested? He had started saying to people within two weeks of the election, I'm, I'm just not going to leave. Now, I don't think it was a plan, it, it, but it was in his mind, uh, you know, I'm not leaving, we're never leaving. Why would you leave when, when you won an election? Um, I don't know what would have happened if January 6, 2021 didn't happen. Well, let's talk about January 6. What was his plan on January 6? It was to rally people and go to march to Capitol Hill and protest in a civil way. Is that what you think he wanted? He says, you know, and his aides always point to that he said, you know, march peacefully and patriotically uh, to his allies. Uh, I don't think that he had a grand thought of what might happen. I think that he was so angry and so riled up that it was just stop this somehow, and this being the certification of Joe Biden's Electoral College win. So when the Capitol uh, was overtaken, uh, there were calls made by the leaders of the Congress to Donald Trump to call this off. And did he not take the calls on purpose, or why did he wait a couple hours, do you think? He did speak to Kevin McCarthy, uh, who, who told Trump that people were breaking into McCarthy's office. 
what we heard at the time and what we reported at the time was that Trump was watching on television and, and was happy with what he saw. So uh, when the, the violence occurred on January 6th, uh, eventually Donald Trump issued a statement. How long was it before he actually issued the statement? And did he write that statement or did people force him to give that statement? At around 2.20 or 2.24, I have the time stamp wrong, uh, I think, but he, he tweeted essentially that this is happening because my, and I'm paraphrasing, this is happening because Mike Pence didn't do what he should have done, meaning reject Joe Biden's win. Um, that was his first statement. Then eventually aides spent time begging him to say something. He finally issued another statement saying, you know, be peaceful. It was an emerging process. So uh, since he did leave the office, has he ever talked to Joe Biden? No, no. He did leave Joe Biden a letter, you know, a traditional letter. And what Biden said to people uh, who work with him after he got it, it was, you know, in Trump's scrawl, familiar scrawl. Um, he said it was more, he was more gracious than he'd expected he would be. Well, thank you for coming here today and giving us uh, insights into Donald Trump, our uh, president at one point. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.